Yeah, so shell shape is very complicated and cells can have very convoluted morphologies. So on the left, we have a dendritic cell. It's an immune cell. And on the, in the center and right, we have two cancer cells. So these are fluorescence microscopy images. They're, they're light sheet images, which means we not only have the, the shape information, we also have um, the dynamics across time, right? And we know from, from decades of biology research that shape is important to cell function, right? So shape is obviously important in neurons because it allows the cells to, to preferentially connect to particular um, other neurons, right? Shape is important for, for migrating cells because cells move by dynamically changing their shape, right? So this is a, a zebrafish keratocyte. It's a cell from the surface of a, um, a zebrafish. And if you put it on a flat sheet, the cell will move forwards, right? We know that things like cilia in the lungs help help lungs to function um, by, by aiding lung cells and, and capturing material, right? So in general, we have, we know that cell form is important to cell function. And we have for, again, decades now, studied how intracellular signaling regulates cell morphology. And we know that cell morphology is the result of many feedbacks between intracellular signaling, which governs the cell cytoskeleton, as well as the mechanical environment of the cell, okay? And it's actually somewhat unfortunate for us that cell morphology is the result of so many feedbacks because it's easiest to image cells and it's easiest to study intracellular signaling if you image cells on a, on a flat surface. So this is a, a melanoma cell on a cover slip. You can see that the melanoma cell sort of flattens itself out into what looks like a, a fried egg shape. Um, if you were to look at this in 3D, the, the nucleus um, would, would stick up, right? However, if we put these same sorts of cells in 3D collagen or in a zebrafish, instead what they do is not flatten out like this, but, but round up and extend these structures um, called blebs, right? So it used to be very, this used to be problematic, right? Because we want to study how intracellular signaling regulates cell morphology, but if you put cells in an environment where that's easy to study, they have a, a different morphology than they would in vivo, okay? But recently we've, um, there have been advances in microscopy that allow us to study both shape and shape dynamics in live cells and in physiologically relevant environments. So this is a microscope we built um, years ago now, but there, there are now other microscopes like this. It's a, it's a light sheet microscope that enables near isotropic resolution of cells in soft environments like collagen with no glass anywhere near the collagen. Because the cells, since the, the collagen couples to the glass, even if you put a cell in collagen near glass, the cell can still adapt, can, the cell can still sense the glass through the collagen and adapt a, a different morphology, right? So there, there are no hard surfaces at all in this microscope. And microscopes like these, light sheet microscopes in general, general, allow us to take movies like this. So this is a dendritic cell moving in 3D collagen. And we care about this cell's shape because we it's an immune cell that we've tricked into thinking that there's a pathogen around. So dendritic cells are sort of the, the sentinels of the immune system. So these cells roam around your body looking for pathogens. And when they find something, they try and move as quickly as possible um, to other cells to, to activate adaptive immunity, right? So the cell is trying to move as quickly as possible. The question is, how do we make sense of 3D data like this? This is a 2D projection, but how do we make sense of shapes that are as complicated as this. All right, so I showed you a movie. This is a scan through a single um, frame. Here, so we're scanning up and down in the image. Right, and one thing we can do to make these sorts of images far more understandable is simply to segment them. Okay, so here we've segmented the cell and painted the surface of the cell by curvature 
um, by curvature, right? So red are areas of high surface curvature and blue are areas of, of low surface curvature and yellow are the, the collagen fibers. And this, this does make the image far more interpretable, right? But segmentation alone here is, is not enough. We still don't understand how intracellular signaling um, can govern morphology in these 3D environments. We still don't have the tools to make sense of how morphology and signaling are coupled, okay? So how do we, um, even though segmentation can be extremely tricky and is very valuable, how do we move to the next step of analysis and, and begin to make sense of these 3D segmented structures? Um, well, the general strategy we take is, is one that is obvious to computer science in general. So make a sort of object-oriented analysis structure, right? So we break up these 3D objects, these 3D images into objects like the cell surface or like collagen or, or anything else that we might imagine, right? And then analyze those um, structures as objects. And this allows us to um, come up with more interpretable analysis frameworks and hopefully eventually incorporate theory but it also enables us to, to plunder new fields of computer science, right? So biology has benefited enormously from advances in computer vision algorithms, but shape in computer science is often studied in the field of computer graphics, right? So the, the field that powers Pixar movies and, and rendering in general. Um, so can we use not just the, the rendering algorithms from these fields, but also the analysis algorithms to begin to, to understand um, 3D cell morphology, okay? And when we break up uh, a biological image like this into scenes, we, we do have a problem, which is that there's, there's data that isn't an object per se, right, but that we still want to analyze. And the main way we, we deal with that sort of data um, is to map it to objects. So here we've mapped um, fluorescence intensity. This is the, the fluorescence intensity of a, of a PI3 kinase reporter um, to the cell surface, right? So we just, for every um, face on the cell surface, we extend a circle around that face, grab up all the intensities inside the circle and map it to the cell surface. It's a little more complicated than that, but conceptually all we're doing is averaging the, the fluorescence intensity near each point on the surface, okay? So we can do that. We can map um, intensity information to the cell surface, but then what? How do we analyze the intensity information? Well, if you look at um, these cells, you'll notice, first of all, that PA3 kinase 10 looks like it associates with these blebby structures. The, the structures that balloon away from the cell are called blebs. So we would like to be able to, to see if that is true, to analyze PI3 kinase only near the blebs. And we know, in fact, from, from many years of study, many years of study in migration, that signaling tends to be different near protrusions, right? Protrusions like blebs. So we want a computational framework to find things like blebs. But cells, we're back to our to our cells again. Cells extend many different stereotype structures, right? They, there are lamellopodia, these planar sheets on the left, and blebs are, are balloons in the middle, and there are, there are philopodia, which are little stick-like extensions on the right, and there are yet many other sorts of extensions that stereotyped extensions that cells can extend, like retraction fibers or uropods, or um, this, like the cilia we saw earlier, or, or dendritic spines on neurons. So we want to build a platform that can find um, all of these sorts of structures, okay? And the way we obviously we need a machine learning framework um, because I don't know, we, we don't have a way of enumerating what all these structures are. We don't know what types of structures exist, let alone know how to best find them, okay? But we want to make a machine learning framework that is as easy as possible for a grad student in a lab to implement themselves. So the way we do that is to note that um, biologists have named these structures for decades. And it's true that biologists are, are experts, but they're also people. And when people look at a 3D object, they tend to, to make sense of that 3D object in, in known ways, right? So rather than 
ask people to generate entirely um, training data by painting, say, the philopodia on the surface of the cell, that, that would take a while. We're instead going to constrain the generation of, of training data with our knowledge of human perception, right? So we know, for example, that when people look at a shape like this, and if you ask them to break it into parts, most people will break it into parts there. This was um, has been known for a long time in the, the perception literature. And furthermore, if you ask them to break up um, in objects like this into three parts, most people will choose the, the, the segmentation that breaks the object up um, into parts with the shortest cuts, <laughs> right? And it turns out that if you combine this minima rule and the shortcut rule, we find that most people, when given a 3D object, will decompose that object into convex parts, okay? All right. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to decompose the, the surface of the cell into convex parts, into convex patches using heuristics. And that way we won't require people to generate training data from the, the, from the raw data itself. Now it turns out that convex, that we can't actually do convex surface decomposition exactly. It's just too computationally expensive. So instead we use heuristics to do it approximately, which is also good because our, our data is noisy. Right, so we use a, a standard watershed algorithm to, to break up the cell surface into parts. Right, a, an image is a is a four lattice essentially, and a, a triangle mesh is composed of triangles, which is a, a three lattice. So we can also use a watershed segmentation algorithm on the surface of the cell. Right, then we merge those patches until we get to a convex surface decomposition like this. All right, and now we can do our machine learning. Okay, All right, so this is a dendritic cell broken up into convex patches. Okay, we have people tell us which patches should be merged and which patches should not be merged. Okay, and then we furthermore ask people to click on patches that are and are not. Um, the, the protrusion of interest, right? So then we have, we with our two machine learning models, we can find lamellopodia. And we can do this not just with blebs or lamellopodia, but also with other structures like, like philopodia, okay? And we do all this with a very simple linear support vector machine. I tested a few other um, simple machine learning algorithms, but given the amount of data we have, which is sometimes 40 points, they, the, the simplest algorithms seem to, to work best. Okay. And they work similarly, right? Presumably because we have so little training data. Okay. And you can sort of, like I just said, generate a, a reasonable model from only one cell. I try and click on 40 or so patches in each cell. Um, Obviously, if, if you train on more cells, your, your model does improve. And just from a biological perspective, you probably don't want to train on only one cell because so that, that might be a weird cell, right? But you can get reasonable results with, with very little data. So this is the same user training on four different cells and apply to this one cell. So they, they are different, these models, but um, conceptually, they're, you have similar results there. Okay. However, if we ask three different users to train on the same set of four cells, we see that the models are actually more different than one user training on just a few different cells, right? So, um, which is sort of interesting in and of itself, you would think that you, in this space, that one cell would not be enough to reach biological conclusions that you should go and image 20 cells, but it, it turns out that you um, run into the problem even before you get to a few cells, that different people have different ideas <laughs> of what these structures are. Um, so you're better off asking more people to, to label the structures than you are even getting more data, right? Because getting people to agree is, is harder um, than generalizing the, the model from a single person. Right. 
But even worse than that, if you ask one person to click on all of the patches that are blebs, and that same person just a, a minute or so later to click on all of the patches that are not blebs, you get very different models. So in the first case, you'll get a cell that is 45% blebby. In the second case, you'll get a cell that is 77% blebby, even though logically they should be the same, right? Um, and I think that's because people don't like clicking on patches that they're not sure about. <laughs> that it's actually if you ask different types of people. So if you ask microscopists or biologists or computer scientists to click on um, to click on cells, the the major difference seems to be that the fields are variously risk averse. Um, so they interpret a a noisy a bit of noisy data differently. Okay, so instead. We, we don't ask people to decide if something is a bleb or not a bleb. We instead ask them to click on patches that they are certain are blebs and on patches that they are certain are not blebs. And that gives us a, a more stable answer, a more stable model sort of in the, in the middle of those two. Okay, and despite the fact that um, these models are, are largely subjective because they're based on training data, we can still make a model in one lab in our custom built microscope and apply it to data from another lab on a, a different type of cell taken with a, a different microscope. So this is um, a T cell imaged by the a lattice light sheet from there from the original lattice light sheet paper. We can ex still use our dendritic cell lamellipodio model on, on cells like this. Okay. So even though the models themselves are subjective, they can be objectively applied. Right, this is a, another example of applying um, data to, to microscopes other than what we have, right? So this is a, a breast cancer cell migrating within the zebrafish vasculature, and we can train on just this single movie, a retraction fiber detector, right? So that's what you see there. We can detect other sorts of um, structures. So this is a, a fluorescence image of some neurons and we can find not only detect dendritic spines but also cluster them the spines by by spine morphology right so that's what's colored there so you can see we can extend the framework to, to many different types of structures um and i'm not going to to tell you an application now but there, there are more details of the the application in in, in our paper it was published in nature methods i guess a year and a half ago now um, so there, as an example, um, we sought to determine how KRAS and PIP2 associate with blebs. So it's sort of, if you look at these cells, it looks like KRAS and PIP2 both associate with blebs. Both KRAS and PIP2 are, are central, are signaling molecules that are central to many different processes. But if you carefully dissect um, what they're actually what these signals are actually doing here we find that pip2 associates with blebs but kras actually does not what happens with kras is the the membrane is wrinkling near blebs and kras appears to be roughly uniformly labeling that wrinkled membrane right and we have an even longer application that was recently posted on bioarchive um, so these are melanoma cells migrating in soft collagen and it turns out that because soft collagen is, is hard to image in people don't actually and people didn't actually understand how these cells migrate even though melanoma is a, is a very invasive cancer um, type and, and in vivo they often migrate in in soft situations so we found that the the melanoma cells are are eating their way through the the collagen so they reach out. So it was thought that cells move via blebs by extending blebs into the collagen. We found that they do indeed extend blebs into the collagen, but they use those blebs to grab the collagen, bring the collagen toward the cell surface, and then ingest it. <laughs> so the, the melanoma, they're literally eating their way through these soft environments like you might imagine cells eating their way through, through jello, right? So there, there's more, if you're interested, there's more about that on BioArchive. Okay, I mean, I'm also very interested in extending um, the notion of how do we analyze data, how do we analyze cell surfaces and data defined on the cell surface. So one classic way of analyzing data in general 
is to do a spectral decomposition of that data. So that would be a Fourier decomposition in real space or a spherical harmonics decomposition on a sphere. And it turns out that that same math works on the surface of a cell, right? So these are, this is the, an orthonormal basis for data decomposition defined on the surface of a dendritic cell. And it's simply the Fourier spherical harmonics math applied to the surface of, um, to a non-Euclidean manifold, okay? So we haven't finished this yet, but the, the goal is to, to figure out if we can understand signals on the cell surface by, by decomposing them into this basis, which allows us to both um, see how um, rough this data is, but also send it into um, machine learning algorithms like a, like a simple PCA. I'm also hoping that we'll be able to use a computer graphics framework to, to track data defined on the cell surface as well as the cell in various reference frames. Um, so this is the blue and the gold here, our dendritic cells image 60 seconds apart, right? You can see that the lamellipodia are extremely dynamic, right? So even though these cell shapes are, are quite different, we can still use a computer graphics framework to, to map the blue shape onto the orange shape, right? and then hopefully understand how signals change across time, even though um, the cell shape is also changing dramatically. And we, we, we've learned quite a bit in 2D by studying how cell shape, cell shape changes across time. But I'm hoping that when this sort of framework is merged, is, is moved into 3D, we can understand um, we can track in, in many different reference frames, right? So this reference frame is essentially the, the cell intrinsic reference frame, which is that of, of curvature and cell shape. But there are also other reference frames like the, the lab reference frame or the collagen reference frame that we can use to understand how things move. Or we could even imagine studying how um, signal A changes in the reference frame of the probability distribution defined by, by signal B. Right, and I don't have a demo, but I wanted to take a minute to describe how the Denuser Lab makes demos in general. I think it's a little unusual. So we have code that was developed a long time ago now um, by, by Seb, who was at the time the lab's software engineer. And the idea is that, the idea is to, is to have a code framework that allows us to, to quickly make demos, right? So it, it's, object-oriented code in MATLAB. Um, movies are defined as, as movie data objects. We have processes that act on these objects and processes can be packaged into something called packages in various ways, right? So you define a hierarchy of processes in order to make many different packages. And that way, um, multiple processes can exist in, that way the same process can exist in, in multiple packages and we don't have to remake the entire GUI. So I think the GUI does look rather rough, but it is also easy to create, right? So this is an example of setting surface parameters for um, the mesh process. These are the, the processes in, in the, for the analysis that I just showed you. Okay, so in summary, um, we built a, a framework for investigating the, the coupling of 3D morphology and signaling. And that framework is, is still incomplete, but we showed you um, a detector to generically detect morphological motifs. I also showed you that, that bias, especially bias in, in interpreting, bias in labeling 3D structures can be large, right? But instead of just ignoring that bias, one, one thing we could do is to, to embrace the limits of, of human perception, in a sense, and um, design algorithms that, are, that acknowledge the fact that humans are not very good at perceiving 3D data, right? And then also I'm hoping that in future we can adapt more algorithms, not just from, from computer vision, but from computer graphics, right? So to understand how, um, to, to analyze non-pixel data, especially data defined on cell surfaces. 
And that's it. I mean, the, the, the methods paper has been published in Nature Methods. We're, we're hoping the, the migration paper will be published soon. And then everything else is a, is a work in progress. Well, thank you. Are there any questions? Um, I, yeah, I do have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so Megan, thank you so much for the presentation. Really interesting and it's very, it's much nicer to hear a presentation than to read the paper, even though the paper has amazing figures, <laughs> uh, which, which is very nice and I recommend everybody to go and check it out. I'm wondering about applications of this um, because it, on the one hand, you do require a pretty high, a pretty special microscope to be able to capture mm -hmm. these images in the first place. Well, it um, does work on confocal images, um, not as well. It does work on confocal images, not not as well. But you have you have to make a new model. Um, right, right, right. That that's that's yeah. Uh, but the the concept, the key mm -hmm. concept core concept of looking at and classifying protrusions, mm -hmm. what I'm calling protrusions, you have many names, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then and then mapping that to behavior is really powerful. So I'm wondering if you have if you have collaborators that have already started using it in different areas, different fields, mm -hmm. um, anything you could tell us about that. I'm curious about how broadly used this approach is mm -hmm. I know it's only a couple of years or a year and a half, but I, 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 have other people picked up on this concept and kind of tried to use it elsewhere? Uh, I don't know. Now it would be in COVID, see how cells react to being infected, things like that. But are there other applications already? Yeah, I mean, people still mostly use it to find structures on cells. Actually, the most requested thing that people ask me for is just curvature. I think it confuses people to calculate the, the curvature on, on surfaces. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, there are people that use it. I don't know if it's that widely used, but I think, I think it's still quite hard to acquire this data. Um, so you, your recommendation, other than your mic, the microscope that you guys have built, other than that, what would be the, the, the next best, uh, kind of suggestion if you couldn't build one of those and you just had to buy one? <laughs> Well, the microscopes we have, many of them are actually um, worse than a confocal in, in with spatial resolution. They have better temporal resolution, but the but the Nature Methods paper didn't in any way make sense of make use of the temporal resolution. Um, so people, it, I guess it would take longer to acquire that data on a on a confocal microscope, but you still could. A confocal okay. microscope are often better even than a lot of slate sheets. Okay. Um, and spinning disk systems or light sheet kind of systems, I mean, mm -hmm. you you'd still prefer confocal because of the, 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 the spatial resolution being a little bit better? No, I mean, I, I think the, the great excitement here is, is really the, the dynamics. Um, yeah, so we haven't quite gotten to the dynamics in the analysis, but hopefully, hopefully we will get there soon. And for that, you really do need a, a specialized microscope. Right. Um, I also think there might be um, applications for for em data mm -hmm. right and making sense of the the em fields um the analysis results in these these huge data sets right but what do you actually do with with this segmented data that alone is still a huge data set and it's still hard to make sense of so how do you how do you understand that yeah uh, certainly the curvature can be critical at, at sign up you know you'll have a, a specific mm -hmm. signature when you get to a synapse the curvature yeah. on one side will be matching the other side and, and there will be specific pattern to what that curvature typically looks like across the whole data set. So you could probably do really interesting work there too. Um, yeah, I mean, I got it to work on dendritic spines very quickly in just, just a few days, even though I'd never applied the system to dendritic spines before it um, to generate. I think I, I generated the training data just by clicking, um, but you can make it work very quickly.